Welcome to A Willing Heart to Please the Father. This is Len LaCroix, and I'm here tonight with my guest, Dr. Andrew Stenhouse, and we are here for um, another chapter of his life. And, uh, Andrew, I want to welcome you back to the program. Thank you, Len. I appreciate it, and I I enjoy uh, these sessions because they... I hope glorify the Lord and then don't in any way glorify me because uh, without the Lord I would have been down a hole. <laughs> yes. Well, they have, and uh, I think it's going to bless a lot of people. And we finished the last chapter talking about your medical studies and your return from Rarotonga to uh, Hamilton, which is on the North Island of New Zealand. And um, tonight we're going to pick it up right there where we ended the last one, and we're going to talk about your residency. So this would be um, when you moved from Hamilton to take it from there where you moved to for your second year. Well, uh, I'd like to first make uh, us a few uh, clarifications. Mm-hmm. After a person gets a, a graduates from medical school, you get a, a cap and a gown and you go through a formal uh, a session of being uh, capped uh, as a doctor, an MD. Mm. And uh, so the first two years after that are called a, a doctor's residency. We are our doctors, but we're in a resident for two years, the first two years after graduation. Mm-hmm. And then the third and fourth years after graduation, uh, we are in a registrar position which is a supervisory plus medical treatments assessment where we take care not only of patients, but we supervise the residents who are uh, on the uh, team that we're working with. Right. So I hope that that may clarify, because it is difficult to understand. Yeah, so thank you for clarifying that. So when we talk about um, your residency, at this point you had actually already done your first year of residency in Hamilton, uh, after you finished that um, several months in Rarotonga where you did a special assignment, now you were moving to where for your second year residency? To Murapara. Okay. Well, in the second year residency, I felt called because they didn't have a doctor uh, associated with it. They had, uh, and they have a, a medical uh, hospital there strictly for obstetrics. Okay. I needed to go there. I felt the Lord was calling me there uh, to uh, help them out with regard to having a doctor and at the same time fulfilling my second year as a resident. Mm-hmm. So, so was this a volu- like you, you had a choice uh, where you could have taken the assignment or chosen not to, to go to Murapara, Murapara? Yes, I had a choice whether to stay in Hamilton or to go to Murapara. Okay. For the so you second accepted year of that. being a re- resident. Okay. And I, and there was one of us went, and that was me. <laughs> uh, and uh, so anyway, uh, it was very interesting year, and uh, uh, there a lot of things occurred during that year that were very interesting. And uh, for example, I was the dentist in the area. Hmm. As well, as though I'd never taken a tooth out, I had to take care of uh, bad, bad, bad teeth. And wow. uh, they, they did indeed, in, in spite of my not knowing it, have one set of pliers for taking, extracting teeth. Wow. Because that's what they are. They're sort of super, <laughs> super pliers. But this one was found uh, in the doctor's office there. Uh, and apparently came from Germany hmm. by, and uh, was left there by a journey, German missionary. And uh, so I was Back in the... glad, to, uh, glad to have that. Yeah, what, what uh, era were they from? Uh, they were from the a- late 1800s. Wow, one, so you had one this pair of pliers. One uh, old pair of pliers from a missionary. Yeah from way yeah. back in the 1800s, and uh, yeah. you were using that to pull teeth out. Now, that yeah. wasn't even something that was part of your medical training, so you kind of got thrown into well, that, I had, right? I'd never taken a tooth out, mm. except my, my own. But, 
Uh, no, that was one of the things that was interesting. The other thing was uh, being by myself um, delivering babies. Wow. Uh, and the nearest obstetrical hospital was 55 miles away. Uh, and uh, most and the, most of the patients were uh, Maoris because they were the group of people, group of people that lived out in the bush okay. in uh, Murapara. I so, see. Uh, and uh, I always had people in the uh, delivery room that I had never seen before come in ready to deliver. So this could happen day or night. Wow, think uh, about that. That's pretty serious year. because normally a doctor would have been seeing an obstetrics patient um, during her pregnancy, but these people would just show up when they're ready to deliver. So you had no history on them. You don't know anything about the risk factors involved or anything like that, or even the patient. And you just They're just presenting to you. They need you to d deliver their baby. That's correct, yes. Were they and coming from, from places that were f farther away or mainly right there? They were from the area. It was called a bush area in yeah. the medical t terminology. And uh, they were really from within, say, 20 miles of the hospital. Okay. And uh, uh, so anyway, I uh, would and thank you, Lord, for taking care of me during that time because he was the one that did all of the work. I, mm. I listened and I did what I heard to do. And uh, one of the ways I found that the easiest way to get a tooth out that's bad is to find uh, the thinnest uh, side of the bone and to make a little crack or fracture in that inside part of the, 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 the jaw uh, and uh, the teeth, tooth swaps out when you try and help it. Otherwise, you're in a, uh, quite a mess. So yeah. the Lord showed me to do that too. Wow. But with the so, pregnancies, with the deliveries, um, what uh, you, did you have much training in that type of thing? Because you, you weren't an uh, obstetrician so, or an OBGYN, so did you really have very much training in delivering babies? Yes, uh, we, we all had to do about um, 10 to 12 deliveries on our own, supervised, of course, mm -hmm. uh, and we did that uh, as part of our training. Okay. And... Uh, but if there had been any complications that were severe, I would not have seen them before, you know. So. Did you have any um, that got complicated? Oh, yes. I had some complicated patients, um, and, uh, uh, but the Lord showed me what to do and guided me, and we got through everything. I didn't lose any babies. And, wow, uh, praise God. The mothers were, and the mothers were pleased. Mm. And uh, I gave them lots of anesthetic, as, as I did with the the, uh, the dentist part. Gave them lots of anesthetic. They call me the painless doctor. So, <laughs> so anyway, the, I gave the ladies the, their um, in local anesthetic, and uh, we got every baby out healthy. And, wow. Uh, I'll give you a story about one of the babies came out, a beautiful child. And the mother started to cry, and I said, what's wrong, dear? And she said, oh, he's done it again. I said, what did he do again? And she said, he's given my baby away. And what? the husband had been betting on his child. Oh, no. But because the, doc the hospitals uh, and the government gave them a, uh, about $7 or $10 a year, I mean a, a month, um, uh, as for every child they have, and he was using the ch future child's money as a betting part. Wow. So she was crying because of that. I nearly cried because of it too, but I didn't mm. say anything to him because they were, they were bigger than me, so I didn't. Yeah. So when you did these, um, these deliveries, did they have at least a nurse there to assist you? Yes, they had a nurse, uh, a nurse that specialized in it, Mm -hmm. And they were very helpful, and they knew what to do. I'd tell them what the next thing to do was, and they would do it, and they were very helpful. Yeah. So you did these uh, deliveries, and, and by the grace of God, you didn't lose a single baby. That's amazing. No, no. 
And uh, did you ever uh, have a, a patient name the child after you? Oh yes. They they would say, Doctor, can we call this patient Andrew? And I said, Because <laughs> you asked, you can. <laughs> <laughs> so now, if you go back to Murapara, there's probably these babies from that era, a bunch of Andrews living yeah, around. Yeah, there'll be there. a bunch of Andrews running around. On <laughs> So, any other experiences that you want to tell us about in Murapara? Uh, not really. Um, it was a most exciting time for me because I was also had to do uh, surgical work, uh, sewing up everything, uh, and, uh, and then up the. And I was also the doctor for a, another little town called Kayangaroa, hmm. and uh, would have a. A practice there every uh, every week I'd have to go up and the only other interesting thing was that there were uh, great lorries filled with uh, trees f- would follow me down the road and try and run me off the road at night when I'd go home Wow, but, you were walking down the road or, or driving? Yes, they would follow me at great speeds down the road Wow, these big trucks carrying uh, trees like logging trucks, right? Yes, logging trucks, and uh, I'm, I, I'd ask the Lord, Lord, you got me here, get me out of this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they probably didn't have a sidewalk, so you were kind of walking on the road, right, in the dark? Yes, that's right. Now, when, how did you get to that other location that you had to go to once a week? Did you use public transportation, or did you have no, a vehicle? No, I had a car, okay. and would drive my car up there and drive back. Mm-hmm. So when you finished your time there, your uh, residency in Murapara out in the bush, then where did you return to afterwards? After uh, Murapara in the bush was my second year of residency, and that were the next thing we had was a first year of registrar. Mm-hmm. In addition to two years of residency after you graduate from medical school, you have two years of residency and then two years as a registrar. Okay. And I was about to start my registrar uh, where, period of time. Okay. Where did you go for that? I went back to Dunedin. Okay. Uh, I got uh, called back there, asked if I would come there, and I said, yes, I'd love to come to, back to Dunedin. So, and so that's sort of another chapter in my life at the beginning of the uh, uh, registrar period of time. Yeah, so the place you went to in Dunedin was a hospital that was a teaching hospital, correct? Correct, and yes. What, was your, what position did you get assigned to there? Well, it was really interesting. Uh, I applied for a position in the Department of Medicine, and uh, also that came with a position of... Uh, as a registrar at the hospital mm-hmm. and uh, the Lord arranged things. It's really funny, Lord, uh, Len, when you be obedient, the Lord arranges everything and if you don't struggle over everything, mm-hmm. Father takes care of everything and takes care of you. Mm-hmm. But what happened was that uh, I applied for a position in uh, as a registrar and usually in the first year you were a junior registrar and in the second year you were senior registrar mm. but uh, when i got down there they had uh, positioned me as the senior registrar doing the second year work uh, for the professor of medicine uh, who was also a doctor at the hospital he was the chief professor of medicine right yes in new zealand so yes. um so that was quite amazing there. You skipped over being a junior registrar and went right straight to being a senior registrar. That was unusual, but I think that when you stand back and look at it, you know, the Bible says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up in due time. And you took that humble position out in the bush, which was not typical for someone to do that, and God gave you this uh, senior registrar position and also, there's another verse in uh, Psalm 75 that says, No one from the east or the west or from the desert can exalt a man, but it is God who judges. He brings yes, one down, God. he exalts another. So he gave you this position that you weren't really even seeking after, right, the senior registrar position. No, it surprised me. So was there any pushback from anybody there about you getting that position? 
Oh, yes. There was a lot of uh, uh, talk about my getting uh, the position with uh, people have been waiting for for two or three years to get this position. Mm. And they were very upset with me. And uh, in, a, in their own way, they tried to take it out of me, but it didn't bother me much because I knew it wasn't me that did it, but the Lord did it for yeah. me. What kinds of things did they do to kind of um, try to get you? Well, what they would do is they would call in sick when they weren't sick, mm. uh, when they were on call. Uh, and uh, so this was the main thing where they would increase my load of work by uh, calling in sick that day or a, mm -hmm. a lady doctor had a rheumatoid arthritis and she'd always get a flare-up, she said, when she was on call, so she could never be on call. Wow. There were lots of there were lots of instances like that, but uh, yeah. you know you just take them and the Lord goes before you and you just smile and yep. go on. Now tell me uh, just briefly a little bit about the role of a registrar, and then and then after that tell me the role of a senior registrar because most of us lay people are not really familiar with this term except maybe in an ac academic institution. Yeah. Uh, but for in a, in a medical hospital, teaching hospital, what role does a registrar play? A registrar is above both of the residents. And so, first of all, he takes care of the residents and uh, makes sure that what they do uh, is appropriate. And then the junior registrar checks the, uh, is being checked by the senior resident, registrar mm -hmm. and uh, has to go over all of the work that he has done on the admissions that were admitted. And then in addition to that, the senior registrar has, is in charge of all of the uh, doctors, uh, doctors that send patients to uh, the emergency room, so you have mm -hmm. to go and check all of the patients in the emergency room to mm -hmm. make sure that there are appropriate admissions and make sure that the uh, medicines they were given were correct and the treatment and so on. Right. And uh, in addition to that, in the teaching hospital, the senior registrar was responsible for teaching the, not only the uh, residents, which are the junior doctors, but also the medical students when it's a teaching hospital. Mm -hmm. So the work was quite uh, exhausting in a way because I yeah. would... Uh, I work many times, uh, you know, through the night and then have to just keep going the next day. Wow. So a registrar, they have their own, they have to practice medicine on their floor um, yeah. in their department. Plus, in, in addition to seeing patients, they're also overseeing uh, junior doctors, the residents on their floor. So, for example, when a resident goes to see a patient that has come been admitted onto the floor, the registrar follows up, right, to go and see that patient, and then they talk with the uh, the resident to see what his uh, plan is for caring for that patient? That's correct, Len. And then in a teaching hospital, when you've got a, over you a professor, you teach the doctors coming in, both the, the residents and uh, the, the junior registrar. So I was res responsible for teaching people that were actually had been doctors longer than myself. Okay. So these registrars, you'd have one on each floor, right? So as the senior one, registrar, at least one. yeah, at least one per floor. They were overseeing the residents on their floor, and then you, as the senior registrar, you had your responsibilities uh, with patients plus the emergency room, and you also had your oversight as a supervisory role over the other registrars. Right, and then I had to do the majority of the teaching to the students. Okay, very interesting. Well, that was a lot of responsibility that you were given, um, and you skipped over some things that other people had to go through, but you can definitely see the Lord's hand in that, and despite the fact that people were jealous and uh, tried to get that from you, what ended up happening... I mean, I with the chief professor, uh, did he just change his mind uh, after the, all the pushback he got from other doctors? No, no, no. They never changed their mind, and they were very grateful for what I did. Yeah, that's wonderful. Now, um, did you, when, what influenced 
the chief professor's decision when you came in from Hamilton uh, to Dunedin. Uh, actually, you didn't come from Hamilton. You came from Murapara, but you had previously been in Hamilton. And when you came to Dunedin, what was it that influenced basically your past reputation with the other doctors in Hamilton? Yes, that was the reason that uh, I got the position was that the unbeknownst to me, the chief of the hospital, who was different from the chief of medicine, had called the chief doctor at Hamilton uh, uh, and found out about me then, and was told, don't put anybody else but Stenhouse in that position. Wow, praise God. Well, the Lord is good. And uh, that's a wonderful testimony about the faithfulness of God again and uh, your willingness uh, to serve him in, in the bush, you know, which is all part of the theme of uh, a willing heart to please the Father. So, Andrew, yes. I want to thank you very much for being with us tonight and sharing your life experiences with us back there during your residency. And uh, thank you very much. And we're going to close this out and uh, finish our, our uh, chapter for tonight. And I look forward to our next talk together. Well, I look forward to it, too, too, but I just wanted to make sure that everybody listening realized that it wasn't Andrew that was doing all this. It was my Heavenly Father. Absolutely. And all thank I you. had to do was be obedient to Him. That's right. Well, In thank every you. instance. That's right. Well, thank you, Andrew, and God bless thank you. you. Have a good night. You too. Good night. Good night.